All right. So today we are going to talk about the carbohydrate metabolism. Uh, basically, we are dealing with the diabetes, mainly with the diabetes. So when uh, and how we are going to check for diabetes or how we check the glucose metabolism? Of course, we have to measure the glucose. Where can we measure the glucose? Oh, mostly we do a blood test, but we can measure in the urine or we can measure in the liquor as well. So these are the major sampling for the checking for the glucose homeostasis. Okay, so when we do, for example, when we do the blood samples, we can take the blood, we can use the venosus blood, we can use the whole blood, we can use only the plasma, or we can use the capillary blood. Now, these are different sources, so they do have different uh, results, because mostly what we do have most of what we do have the venosus uh, plasma, and this is the gold standard for measuring the glucose, uh, let's see, level. The venosus blood, when you take the whole blood, in the whole blood, the glucose value usually is less because in the red blood cells, we do have less glucose concentration comparing to the plasma. In the capillary blood, but includes some extracellular fluids as well. Relatively, this is between these two, the venosus and the whole blood. The urine can be used for screening the glucose homeostasis as well, but you know that we do have a certain rate when the plasma uh, glucose level when exceeds this level about 10 millimoles or 11 millimoles per uh, liter that you can check the urine because you do have some glucose in the urine as well. And that's urine samples can be used, for example, for checking, let's say, the glucose homeostasis as a follow-up measurement. The liquor or the cerebrospinal fluid measurement can be used as well. Normally, the, uh, the ratio of the CSF and the uh, uh, serum glucose is about 0.6, so relatively we do have less uh, glucose in the cerebrospinal fluid. Now, uh, for diagnostic purpose, always we have to use venosus plasma or in serum, usually in the practice, the sera is used, but after eight hour fasting, and what they're using, usually the enzymatic test, the hexokinase or glucose oxidase method, this is what the lab uses. Some other possibilities, for example, that step uh, strips, you already, I think, seen it, or maybe you had in a clinic or in other area when you use this strip. However, this is only for emergency care or for home monitoring. So the patient who has diabetes, they can use it for checking their glucose level day by day. This is not for the diagnostic purpose. For diagnostic purpose, you always have to use the venosus plasma. Okay, let's see the next slide. Okay. Now, this is what I already told you that the concentration in the whole blood is about 15% is lower than in the plasma. And the reason because the red blood cell has less, let's see, glucose in it and plus the dry material. Now, the venosus glucose concentration is about one millimole lower than a capillary blood glucose. This is due to the insulinic effect. And usually this is how the cellular uptake of the glucose. Now the urine. A uh, urine glucose test can be read fast positive or fast negative results as well, depending on, for example, the vitamin C level. Now, glucosuria without hyperglycemia, that can occur. So who has a normal blood glucose level can have glucose in the urine because maybe they do have some problem with the glucose reabsorption. You know that in a filtrate, the glucose is filtrated. However, in the proximal tubular system, the glucose is reuptaken, but they do have a transport maximum rate. And this is why normally if we exceed a certain level, about 11 millimole per liter 
and when we do have a normal GFR, this is when the glucose can occur in the urine. However, if you do have some tubular problem or you do have a problem with the transport mechanism, you can have glucose in a lower serum glucose concentration as well. Now, that can happen when the, somebody has hyperglycemia. So in the blood, we do have a higher glucose concentration. However, there is no glucose in the urine because mostly this is due to the decreased GFR because the amount of glucose that is uh, usually passing by the urine is depending on the serum glucose level, it depends on the GFR, plus depends on the tubular function, so how much can be reabsorbed. So these three is going to determine the amount of glucose what is filtrated by the urine. Now, uh, this is what we mentioned, I already mentioned is a uh, positive and negative, that the glucose oxidation, when we do have a vitamin C level, and that can alter the serum glucose, con I mean, the urine C uh, glucose concentration. Now, let's see when we do have abnormal glucose level. It can be over the normal values or can be lower than the normal values. If we have higher one, this is what we call as a hyperglycemia. Usually we're talking about if the serum fasting serum glucose concentration is higher than 6.5 millimole per liter. That can happen in diabetes, in mellitus. However, in stress or inflammatory reaction, for example, acute myocardial MI or infection, that can elevate the glucose concentration due to the stress situation or elementary, if you eat a lot of chocolates, or if you load yourself full with chocolates of glucose, that can cause, let's see, an elevation of the glucose, but only for the short term, short time. And another thing that is the dumping syndrome, usually the dumping syndrome occurs in a patient who has gastrectomy, and this is why the glucose level can be very uh, sharply uh, elevated or increased due to the uh, missing of the reservoir function of the stomach and a lot of undigested food gets into the intestine and not only the hypovolemia but the high glucose concentration and uh, the stress situation is going to elevate the serum glucose level. And there are some other endocrine diseases, including acromegaly, when we do have an increased growth hormone production, or when we do have an increased cortisol, but this can be, let's see, the endocrine disease, or it can be a treatment, for example, an iatrogenic problem, or hyperthyroidism as well, when we do have an elevated thyroid function. Now, the opposite can happen when we do have a decreased glucose concentration, and this is the hypoglycemia. The most commonly occurs is hypoglycemia in the diabetic patient, usually the type 1, the insulin-dependent or the insulin-treated patient, when they overdose the insulin, or they cannot, let's see, eat enough or not in time, or they do have an excess physical activity, and this is why in the serum the glucose is used up and can develop a hypoglycemia. However, fasting hypoglycemia can be due to the alcohol or drug effect. For example, the alcohol due to the inhibition of the gluconeogenesis in, in the that can cause hypoglycemia, usually the next day when you are drunk and the next day when you do have a dug of hair and basically you don't feel so well, this hypoglycemia is due to the alcohol in you suppression of the glucose uh, synthesis. However, who somebody has, for example, severe liver diseases, such as, for example, cirrhosis, they can develop right after eating hyperglycemia, but in longer term, when the glucose is eliminated from the blood after the liver doesn't have any glycogen, so the patient usually suffering of a postpandrial hypoglycemia and seizures as well. Uh, sepsis or Addison disease, when we do have the adrenocortical failure or a tumor of the insulin secreting cells, or non-beta cell tumor, all can cause a fasting hypoglycemia. Now, reactive postpandrial hypoglycemia 
usually can be due to the alimentary problem, the post-gastrectomy and the late dumping syndrome or inherited metabolic disorders. For example, in children who has galactosemia when they cannot utilize the galactose. However, we are going to uh, measure in early age, right after delivery, whether they do have this urethral transferase or not. Now, okay, so the next one, let's see a case report right here. We do have a 61 year old man uh, who was treated with hypertension for the last 15 years and no other disease he had. Family history of type 2 diabetes, one sibling out of four had type 2 diabetes, drug sensitivity is unknown, his present medication includes beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and ACE, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, and diuretics. This is what they used for treating the hypertension. Okay, now, so, uh, okay, serostomia, so it's meaning that uh, it's a dryness, heart felt, polyuria, polydipsia, no other complication, and he had no fever, no thoracic or abdominal pain, he had good appetite, no weight loss, no gastrointestinal symptoms, and he has regular stools, no blood or black color or mucus, so naritai stools. No stepping up on urination, so it doesn't feel anything. And neither hematuria or nicturia can be uh, seen. At family doctor emergency, they checked, let's see, the blood glucose using these strips, okay, these paper strips, and it was 28 millimol per liter. And of course, immediately they sent to the uh, hospital and to checking for diabetes. Okay, now let's see what they seen. Uh, this guy was a cyclic obese one. The waist circumference is 112. Emphysematosus chest and the heart rate was 65 normal. The blood pressure is was elevated, and my systemic uh, systolic murmur could be heard over the carotid artery. Possible. This is due to the uh, atherosclerotic plaque, maybe it was uh, the carotid artery. Otherwise, it was a negative status. Okay, let's see the blood results. So, this is what we do have, as you already figured out, that we do have an elevated glucose, hemoglobin A1C is elevated, and we do have a lot of glucose in the urine, and we do have acetone or ketone bodies in the urine as well. Okay, so. This patient possible has diabetes. Now, how we are going to diagnose diabetes? This is very uh, important to know it. Now, this diagnosis is a little bit different uh, if you go to the hospital or if you go to the family doctor. Because in a hospital, if somebody goes to the hospital in an emergency or any other case, for sure they are taking the fasting blood glucose level, so they are not dealing with any other uh, blood test. Mm -hmm. However, if you, for example, go to the family doctor, the family doctor can do, for example, it's a cold random blood glucose test. This is the first one. So it's meaning that this glucose could be taken anytime. And if you do have, this is a step one. If you do have, let's see, a high glucose level, doesn't matter whether you had a nice chocolate or something else, if it's higher than 11 plus, you do have the classical symptoms of diabetes that includes polyuria, polydipsia, weight loss, with or without ketosis, you can, let's see, diagnose diabetes immediately. However, if the patient does not have any symptoms that I mentioned before, the next one, what you have to do, okay, order the fasting blood glucose test or order, let's see, that goes to the hospital and check the fasting blood glucose level. If the patient has, let's see, with a random blood glucose measurement, less than 5.5 for sure is nothing to do with the glucose homeostasis. So we do have a normal carbohydrate metabolism. Now, why is it important? Because if you see, do we have eight hours fasting? There is almost no way. If you go to the bed, maybe midnight and wake up at seven o'clock, you still have 
uh, 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 don't have eight hours fasting. And when you wake up, almost every four hours, you are taking some food. So this way, it's very rare that we do have a fasting situation. But this is why it's a very good one, the random blood glucose measurement. However, it's more precise on when we are taking the fasting blood glucose measurement. Okay, now let's see the next one. Now the patient goes to the hospital and of course, they're not eating anything for eight hours, but they can drink water. Not, let's see, club soda and not maybe juice or anything, or coffee or tea or anything, but they can drink water. Now, and when the blood test is taken from the fasting blood, it now, as you see here, that less than five millimole per liter, now is a normal value. However, if you do have over seven millimole per liter in a fasting blood glucose test, what they do, okay, this could be diabetes, so let's check again. If the next time, maybe one week later, if the next time is still higher, than seven millimole per liter. And I'm seeing that this patient does not have any kind of, let's see, sign of diabetes. However, if they do have, for sure, you have to assume that this patient has diabetes. Now, there are between, let's see, five and seven, there are two different discrete, let's see, levels, such as between five and six. What they're saying that, well, it's higher than a normal, However, is does not have, let's see, a very high chance to develop diabetes. So this is what they're saying. Every year they should be checked. This is why in the lab, if you go, they usually has a normal value less than six millimole per liter because normally every year you have to check your uh, parameters. Now, in Europe or the, whoever is accepted the WHO classification between six and four, we do have to perform this OGT. You already did this OGT test when you were in the physiology, the practice. What they mean, they're taking about 75 gram, let's see, glucose load. And uh, after two hours, they are measuring the blood glucose level. We do have a separate graph for this one. However, in some other area, usually they are not taking, for example, oversee, they are not doing the oral glucose tolerance test. Now, uh, this is what you can have, for example, this oversee, this American diagnostic algorithm. As you see, they do have a little bit more strict values. So they say that below 5.6 is okay, but if you are of above 5.6 and between seven, Again, they have to measure, let's see the blood, the glucose level, fasting blood glucose level. And if it's over seven, for sure is diabetes. If not, they're saying that this is called the impaired fasting glucose. So it's meaning the patient is living with an elevated glucose concentration. So the chance that he is going to develop or the patient is going to develop diabetes is higher than a normal uh, patient. Now, uh, let's see, let's talk about a little bit the oral glucose tolerance test when we are not going to perform this test. Basically, if the patient is healthy, it's not needed unless, unless she's pregnant. Because during pregnancy, they are going to perform OGT to rule out the uh, diabetes usually occurs during pregnancy. And another thing, if the patient has a very high level of the glucose or the patient is diagnosed with diabetes, they are not going to perform oral glucose tolerance test. They are not going to load the patient with extra glucose. Now, when they perform, when they see the WHO recommendation, as I mentioned before, and I mentioned that during pregnancy, they can perform the oral glucose tolerance test. Now, this is what they do. I mentioned, doesn't matter how heavy the patient is, 75 gram glucose taken already with about two deciliters of fluid, maybe a little bit uh, lemon you can add. And after they measure in the two hours value and based on the two hours value, you do have three different categories. One, it's meaning that after two hours, the patient blood glucose level 
dropping back relatively to the high normal value. So it's going to eliminate this extra glucose from the blood. However, the fasting blood glucose level is higher than a normal. This is why they say that this is a IFG, so impaired fasting glucose. Another one is a clear cut. If you are over 11, as you see in the random blood glucose, now this patient has diabetes. And as early as you can start to treat or the patient, the less side effect can develop or the less chance to develop the side effect. Between these two value, between 11 and 8, you can remember 7.8 and 11.11, .11, doesn't matter. So between 11 and 8, this is what is called the impaired glucose tolerance. So it's meaning that the patient insulin secretion is not enough to remove this extra glucose from the blood. So this two hours is not enough to go back to the normal blood glucose level. So the chance that the patient will develop diabetes or they do have an impaired glucose metal rinse in the future is higher one. So if you are coming from the normal IFG, IGT and diabetes, this is how the chance to have some uh, abnormal uh, glucose homeostasis is higher and higher. This is only what it meant. Now, uh, we already had a hemoglobin A1C value. What is the hemoglobin A1C value? And why the glucose is toxic to the system? The glucose is good, is sweet, and everybody was looking for the sweet things. This is how the evolution worked, and this is why we are choosing the sweet things, the fruits and everything that is ripe, that should be sweet. However, too much sweet is not good, especially the problem when we do have a extra pure, let's say, carbon hydrate that we are taking, because that can increase our glucose level in very rapidly and in very high values. If you do have a complex carbohydrate, the chance that you develop hyperglycemia is less. So why the glucose is not good for our body? Basically because the glucose can modify the proteins and can cause, let's see, especially the aldehyde compound, can cause a sheath base or after, this is the, Amadori rearrangement with a covalently uh, altered protein molecules. And this is what we do have the fructose amine. So as you see here, this is happening normally. If you do have a glucose or a higher glucose, this is shifting toward the formation of this aldehyde. So when we do have, let's see the glycosylation of the protein, let's see, the amino group of the protein, but this is reversible. This is completely reversible. So if the glucose level decreases, everything goes backward. So the protein is dissociated or glucose moiety is dissociated from the protein, and it's no problem. However, if you do have, let's see, if you're forming this sheath base that is still unstable, one can go backward, or if you do have the high value for a longer time, this is automatically, without having any kind of enzymes or anything, slowly it's going to be irreversible, be covalently binding. And not only, let's see, uh, the hemoglobin, but every protein, including, let's see, the collagen, including the elastic, or every protein in every organ, but this is not good. Now, why we are using the hemoglobin A1C? The hemoglobin A1C, that's a protein that usually stays at least for three months or four months in a circulation. And if they do have a covalently altered protein, you can somehow follow the patient carbohydrate metabolism in the previous two, three months. So this is why it's a very good thing to check how was the carbohydrate metabolism in the last several months. However, as I mentioned, every protein usually is altered and depending on the life uh, span of the protein, they do have or not some abnormality. For example, the albumin is again glycosylated. 
However, the albumin half-life about two weeks or so, so relatively it's very rapid turnover. So if you decrease the glucose, relatively the albumin glycation is be less. However, the collagen is not. This is why, for example, the lens, the eye lens, or the, uh, the basal membranes and other is modified and more rigid and more, let's see, water can be absorbed. So it's following up. And for sure, the, let's see, the diffusion of the oxygen and diffusion of the nutrient is abnormal. So this is why the patient could suffer of the consequence of this glycation. Now, they did some studies and they showed perfectly that the, this glycation of the hemoglobin A1C is somehow almost linearly correlated with the side effect of the diabetes. For example, retinopathy progression. If the patient had a higher hemoglobin A1C level, well, the retinopathy chances was much higher one. Now, in normally, there's no in normal individuals, the hemoglobin A1C level is ranging between four and six. However, in diabetes, we cannot maintain this very low level of the hemoglobin A1C because we want to avoid the hypoglycemia because hypoglycemia is more dangerous than hyperglycemia. And this is why the patient will have a little bit higher glucose concentration as a, in a normal situation. This is what we said in diabetic, this should be less than 7% this hemoglobin A1C. And it can be checked about every, let's see, third month. Uh, or hemoglobin A1C now can be used to diagnose diabetes as well. Because only one measurement, for example, when you're measuring the fasting blood glucose, this is only a one point measurement. It's nothing to say about what happened about three months ago or what happening in the last three months. It's only meant that in the last week, for example, or a couple of days, the patient did not overload the body with glucose. So this is why this hemoglobin A1C is a very good marker, for example, to diagnose diabetes and follow the treatment of diabetes as well. Now, how are they measuring relatively? They're measuring this HPS, oops, HPSC method or immune assay. Uh, it's not a cheap measurement, but it's the lab is now it's routinely measures it. A fast lower hemoglobin A1C measure uh, level can be achieved if somebody has a hemolytic anemia or severe blood loss because the turnover of the hemoglobin is altered or fast elevated hemoglobin A1C level if somebody is suffering a polycythemia or post splenectomy because the red blood cell turnover is altered in anemia, for example, again, because the increased red blood cell production and that is going to dilute out the hemoglobin, uh, hypertrichosidemia, hyperbrunemia, and chronic alcohol abuse and salicylate all can alter and can cause a little bit faster elevated hemoglobin A1C level. This is good to know if you know the patient after how you evaluate the hemoglobin A1C level. Now, ketone bodies. Well, uh, ketone bodies is important, especially in diabetes, because what happening? What is the problem in diabetes? Because the glucose utilization is abnormal, the cells cannot uptake the glucose. So cells somehow feel starved. This is why the lipolysis is going to be increased. If the lipolysis increases, we do have a lot of free fatty acids or ketone bodies. And these ketone bodies somehow is a form of energy. But the problem with the ketone bodies is that they do have a acidic moiety. And this is the problem that they can alter the acid-base balance. And that's the problem with the ketoacidosis can develop. However, ketone bodies can be urinated out and that can cause a ketonuria. Now, what can we measure? Relatively, in the blood or in the urine, the acetone can be uh, sensed in somehow. It has a very characteristic smell or odor. And what mm -hmm. they're measuring that the beta hydrobutyric acid level and the acetic acid level. This is how it's converted. But the ratio, as you see here, the acetic acid and uh, 
uh, butyric acid is three to one and can shift to seven to one ratio in severe ketoacidosis, for example, there's a patient. Now, uh, what they're measuring, usually they're using a legal test and that can be seen on a strip, for example, or if you send the samples to the lab, they are measuring uh, relatively the beta uh, butyric acid level. Now, uh, what will happen, okay, when the cells burn free fatty acids instead of glucose, we already said that during starvation. In during starvation, if you do not have enough nutrient, what will happen? The body is not going to utilize glucose and a lot of organ can utilize ketone bodies. This is why it is sparing the glucose that can form. Another one is an abnormal situation when in diabetes, the cell cannot uptake a glucose. This is why we do have an elevated glucose, but we do have an elevated ketone bodies level as well. Now, ketonuria, when we do have a ketone bodies in the urine and in ketoacid urine level can reach or if exceed the, let's see, the three to four millimol per liter. Now, if ketonuria is detected, the patient has to be treated with insulin. It's very, very important. So it doesn't matter what type of diabetes the patient has. If we do have ketone ureas, the patient should be treated insulin right away because it's meaning that the patient at the cellular level doesn't have a normal glucose homeostasis and as early as you can should uh, start treating the patient. Now, uh, how do we diagnose, uh, let's see, the, uh, type two diagnosis. Usually what we do have in the, the diabetes two, this was the, the, in the case studies that we had, possibly the patient has type two diabetes. What's going to support this diagnosis because the glucose concentration was high and the hemoglobin A1C level was high. Uh, glucose was in the urine and acetonazine, and especially the age and the positive family history and how the patient looked like and including the uh, uh, atherosclerotic plaque as well. So, these are the symptoms, polyuria, polydipsia, weight loss, usually mostly seen in type 1 diabetes, including the weight loss. In type 2 uh, diabetes, usually develops, let's see, in very slow rate, and a few or no symptoms and complaints when it's diagnosed. However, in type 1, we do have these classic symptoms and usually occurs in early, but it can come in later age. It's not only the young that, for example, 19 to 20s, it can come for 60 years old or so, so elderly patient as well. Now, uh, what is the different, uh, very frequently high blood glucose is discovered during regular screening routine lab, especially in type two diabetic patients. Now, C-peptide, you already heard about that and you studied in physiology that the C-peptide is a middle portion of the insulin and that is cleaved out from the pro-insulin and that is going to show us the endogen insulin production. Its level is not affected by the hepatic clearance, so this is why it can be used to detect how much insulin uh, the patient can synthesize. In type 1 diabetes, is not used because uh, it can be normal, especially in the uh, honeymoon period. Uh, you will have a lecture about diabetes and you will see it. And uh, it takes about one year to decrease significantly when the C-peptide level is completely disappearing because there's no beta cell at all. In type 2 diabetes, usually is higher one in manifest diabetes. A lower level can be detected in weight loss, beta cell dysfunction, or the late onset of diabetes. This is a insulin, this is a immune mediated uh, type two diabetes or type one diabetes that occurring in a later age, and that meaning that this patient in type two usually they do have insulin resistance. So we do have an increased insulin concentration. However, this insulin in a cellular level cannot uh, affect as much as is needed. Now, autoantibodies is another thing that they should be measured right away. And especially this is how they are measuring or how they're diagnosing type one diabetes. Uh, 
what they are using, this is a GADA, the glutamic acid de uh, decarboxylase antibody, or in some case, the islet cell antibody, it can be measured. So usually, uh, this is the, the GADA that they're measuring. And if it's positive, uh, they can assume that this is a type 1 diabetes, so the immune-mediated diabetes. Another thing that is usually should be screened the patient, if especially the type 1 diabetes, and this is the TSH. Why? Because an other very common autoimmune disorder is the Hashimoto thyroiditis. Maybe you heard about it. And if somebody has an autoimmune disorder, usually they have an additional autoimmune disorders as well, such as, for example, in a Hashimoto, for example, can occur type 1 diabetes or can occur, for example, Addison disease. So this is why it should be checked in every year, the TSH as well, to checking the normal uh, thyroid function as well. In the type 2 diabetes, it's useful, especially for differentiating the uh, hypothyroidism. So the uh, hyperglycemia cause hypothyroidism as well. Now, let's see the complication, and let's look at first the chronic complications, the long-term complication of diabetes. Now, that is a macroangiopathy that usually affecting the large vessels. That can affect the coronary, the cerebral vessels, and the peripheral vascular, and that can cause sclerosis, atherosclerosis. That can be seen on ECG, some kind of ischemic signs, such as the ST depression or angina or the inversion or carotid artery, as in our case, for example, the murmur, for example, can be seen, or uh, you can auscultate, or you can use some ultrasound to measure the thickness of the intima, or in femorals or uh, palpate the dorsal artery, dorsal pedis, to see whether it is uh, decreased or you, maybe you cannot feel it, or bruited heard, uh, no pause is felt, artery or Doppler ultrasound, or dementia, for example, uh, that can occur if somebody has a problem with the large uh, carotid arteries. Now, in type, we're still talking about the case study, the complication. There we do have an auscultation, is the mild systolic murmur over the left carotid artery. As I mentioned, that this could be due to some atherosclerotic plaque. And by ultrasound, they showed that intima thickening uh, of one millimeter in the extracardinal portion of the left carotid artery, the calcified plaque. So this patient develops some atherosclerotic plaque. This is how it looked like, as you see here. This is the intima is uh, enlarged. So meaning that we do have a possible a lipid accumulation. And because it's classi uh, calcified, it could be some kind of calcificated plaque already developed. Now, other complication that includes, for example, the microangiopathy. Microangiopathy, when the smaller vessels are affected, such as the retinopathy or nephropathy. In nephropathy, the microalbuminuria, it can be a predictive factor, for example, to check for the uh, kidney involvement. Uh, you know that usually we do have a very low amount of protein that we are excreting and a very low amount of albumin as well. And if this albumin is start to increase, this is what we call this a minimal albuminuria. And that somehow is proportional with the diabetic altered kidney. Neuropathy, usually this is when the patient cannot sense anything when the small wound happening or immunodeficiency can develop in this patient and usually dermal infection and impaired wound healing can happen. Now, this fat of the diabetic patient is very sweet. So fungal infection is very, very a common one in diabetic patient. Now, look at, for example, this wound, let's say on this uh, pedis. Uh, the, this is a needle when the patient somehow drop down the needle that they used to inject the insulin and they stepped on it and didn't sense anything. And inside this little wound that was the syringe needle inside and the patient did not sense any, any other feature. So this is how the neuropathy works in this patient. Now, this is what we talk about the 
low-grade albuminuria or microalbuminuria. And what they're doing, that's 24 hours urine collected, but mostly they are using the creatinine ratio because that way you don't need to collect the 24 hours urine. If you collect it, this is the albumin level, 30 to 300 milligram per day. If they are measuring the ratio, it should be bigger than 30 milligram per gram creatinine. Now this albumin, microalbuminuria is not only the risk factor for nephropathy, but kidney failure, but cardiovascular diseases as well. Okay, so you have to keep in your mind. Now, what we should do with the patient, if the diabetic one, three monthly fasting glucose level, lipid level, and hemoglobin A1C, and checking the physical parameters, so the body weight, the BMI, the waist circumfest, waist rhipsesio. This is good because you are offering, or, or you are, let's say, ordering the patient to lose weight, mostly in type 2 diabetes, or exercise. So this is some good parameters that the patient can follow, and uh, you can be very happy about when the patient losing weight and a, a patient is very proud that yes, he can do something about, let's see, the, the weight loss. And uh, another one, yearly screening, retinopathy, microalbuminuria, macroangiopathy, and as I mentioned in type 1 diabetes, for example, the TSH should be measured as well. Now let's look at another type, uh, other case studies. Now we do have a six-year-old woman and he, she already diagnosed type 2 diabetes in the last 16 years. And on insulin therapy, retinopathy, hypertension, Parkinson's disease, family history of diabetes, mother and two siblings. Uh, okay, when they got into the hospital, short of breath, 40 days, cough without sprutum, and had fever. Righteous pain when coughing poor appetite, thirsty, without nausea or vomiting, regular stools, without blood, black color or mucus, no thyroid like, no itching and no pain during urination, without bloody or cloudy urine. Okay, when you're looking at the parameters, I'm already showing you the abnormality. Again, we do have a elevated uh, white blood cell count, neutrophilia, the lymphocyte count TV percent is lower one, but we do have granulocytes. Glucose level is very, very high. The CRP level is very high, okay? Usually is less than eight. Procalcitonin and other marker of infl acute inflammation, it's high. Uh, HDL is low, but this can be correlated to the diabetes. And triglyceride is elevated. Again, that is correlated with the diabetes. Um, but lipid levels can be elevated during acute uh, infection as well. So not only because of stress situation, it's mobilized free fatty acids as well. So this can alter the lipid uh, concentration. Now, let's go on. Uh, the diaphragm has sharp contours. The sinuses are clear. And inhomogeneous Parenheim uh, shadows, maximum of six centimeters in diameter, is uh, visible dorsal and basal on the right side, corresponding to inflammation. So that was the result of the chest X-ray. As here you can see, okay, these are that some kind of fluid or some kind of inflammatory. So there's a lobar pneumonia on the right side. Okay, they checked uh, the arterial blood gas test as, as you see here, acidemia, an ion gap is increased. The PCO2 level is decreased, so it's hyperventilating the patient. It's supposed to be compensating the metabolic acidosis we are going to talk about later. Has a very high glucose concentration. Lactate level is altered. The bicarbonate level is decreased and the base excess be negative, very, very negative. So this patient possible has a diabetic ketoacidotic uh, situation. And this is uh, possible due to the infection. Now, this one can happen if somebody has diabetes, they need more insulin to uh, control the glucose because the stress is always increases the glucose concentration and the patient has an abnormal glucose homeostasis. 
So if somebody is testing, let's see the glucose regularly and has type one diabetes, usually they can sense about three days before the infection happens that they need more insulin to normalize the glucose concentration. And if doesn't do this one, the patient could develop a, a diabetic ketoacidosis very easily. Now, how do we treat it? Very, very importantly, first of all, okay, antibiotic should be taken, but the first one, uh, intravenous hydration, sal uh, saline or uh, Ringer lactate solution that they are using. And in this Ringer lactate solution, usually they're giving a little uh, insulin continuously and the potassium should be monitored because the insulin activates the sodium potassium ATPase and decreases the serum potassium level and can cause hypokalemia. Hyperkalemia is bad and hypokalemia is bad as well as you learn in the ECG studies. Well, uh, usually a bicarbonate is not given because bicarbonate administration can alter the respiration and can decrease the respiratory rate. So if it's only in the last, if it's too severe, the acidemia, in that case, they can use bicarbonate. Now, what can be the acute complication, as we mentioned, diabetic ketoacidosis, that can occur mainly in type 1 diabetes or in type 2 diabetes when they need insulin. How do we know when the patient type 2 needs insulin? Ketone bodies in the urine. Our develops within hours and hospitalization is needed. Generally triggered inefficient insulin that can exacerbate it due to the acute inflammation, all right? or intercurrent illness or alcohol abuse, pneumonia, pyelonephritis, sepsis, stroke, myocardial infarction, and so on. And what they see, the urine lab values, the serum glucose concentration, usually is not too high. It varies by patient, but between 14 to, 4, uh, 14 to 40 minimum per liter. Arterial pH usually is less than 7.3, and ketone bodies positivity, and the treatment IV hydration, insulin, and potassium monitoring. This is what we discussed previously. And another thing, and this usually develops in type 2 diabetes, this is a hyperglycemic, hyperosmolar, non-ketogenic coma. In that case, uh, usually it's less frequent one, but more severe with worse, with worse prognosis. Develops slowly with days, okay? And uh, uh, similar time span needed to treat when it develops. Almost always triggered by the severe diseases, pneumonia, pyelonephritis, sepsis, as before. And look at the serum glucose concentration. This patient is very, very high. It's about 40 to 100 millimole per liter or higher. Arterial pH is in normal range. Osmolarity is very, very high. And ketone bodies, usually negative or very slightly high. What we have to do, IV hydration and very huge amount of fluid should be taken and insulin and for sure potassium monitoring and replacement is needed. Now, complication of the treatment, especially this is what we happen when hypoglycemia develops. If the serum glucose is less than three millimole per liter, uh, the symptoms that could be due to the adrenergic effect, the body reaction of hypoglycemia, cold perspiration, dilated pupils, tachycardia, palpitation, hunger, nausea, tremor. This can be the sign of a, a hypoglycemia. It is almost similar who somebody is drunk. This is why it's difficult to distinguish between these two situations. The central nervous system effect, this is due to the hypoglycemia, confusion, agitating, weakness, visual disturbance, scissors, coma can develop. And this is a Whipple triad, symptoms of hypoglycemia. This is proving, this Whipple triad is proving the hypoglycemia, low serum glucose. And if you increase the glucose, that eliminates the symptoms. So this is the uh, Whipple triad, how you can prove that the patient had let's see, hypoglycemia, and the all symptoms or the all clinical sign is due to hypoglycemia. Now, what can cause hypoglycemia? The most common, as we mentioned before, a patient overdosed the insulin, okay, 
or heavy physical activity. Why? Because the muscle that can uptake the skeletal muscle, especially during physical activity, can uptake the glucose independently from the insulinic effect. So the GLUT4 transport system directly can take up the glucose. Or if the patient did not eat or they could eat maybe later, and that can cause hypoglycemia. The fasting hypoglycemia mostly associated with liver disease, we discussed in the, at the beginning, insulinoma, alcohol, fever, and sepsis or reactive, such as a postprandial one, after gastric surgery, genetic abnormalities, for example, the uh, fructose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase problem, and uh, the treatment, mostly what they do is increase the serum glucose level, giving orally or IV glucose or, uh, or gluco glucagon intramuscularly. The complication of the treatment the, the, the these, uh, insul, I mean, the diabetic treatment. Lactic acidosis, it can occur uh, in patients, especially in oral anti-diabetic uh, drug, very rare, but has a very high mortality. There are two types. A type, the lactic acidosis, when we do have an increased production of lactate, this is usually associated with the hypoxia, tissue hypoxia, or anaerobic activity. Or B, that's an inefficient elimination of the cattle bodies by the or lactic acid by the liver, the tumor, alcohol, certain drugs. And another thing, as you said, that the anti-diabetic drugs such as the biogonide, the acetaminophenol solid silate or cocaine can induce this lactate acidosis. In this case, arterial blood, uh, arterial blood pH is very low, lactate level is very high, and the bicarbonate level is low due to the metabolic acidosis. How do we treat it? Hydration again, insulin, and monitoring the potassium level. Now, these are some uh, link that you can use to check, for example, the guidelines and the publication about the diabetes, and uh, that could be used in the future in your study. Additional information, well, it's you should check what is the half-life of insulin. It's uh, important to know, basically, when you want to adjust the patient, uh, give the insulin effect, but at home you can uh, read through this material and that could be very helpful for you. All right, so that was about the theoretical part.